So I have a question for y'all. What do you do when things don't really go your way? You know, like when everything seems like it's crashing down and you're just not really having a good time. Life just isn't really turning out. Do you turn to food? I do. When I get stressed, I turn to food. Or maybe I just try to ignore all my responsibilities. Maybe I try to go on a run even. That's a healthy outlet, right? But today, we're going to be talking about what Jesus says to do, mainly. Not just when times are hard, but when times are actually really good, right? So, I'm going to read this verse, but we're going to have lots of verses to read today. So, pull out your Bibles. Um, Romans 12.1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That's one of my favorite verses. The verse after that, I might get tattooed one day. Um, but 12.1 says, basically, you need to present your life as a sacrifice, you know, just as they did uh, present lambs, just as Jesus presented his life, we need to live our lives in sacrifice for him. And that is just kind of the general thought process I'd like you all to kind of mull on in your minds as we move on through this message about abiding in Christ and what that means. So today, we're going to talk about three specific things. Um, what does abiding mean? You know, that's kind of an uncommon word in today's culture. And two aspects of abiding, which it's basically the same thing, but it's two sides of one coin. So abiding in Christ and abiding in God's love. And so we'll primarily be in John chapter 15 today. So if you guys just want to turn to that, there's, we're going to be going over verses 1 through 16. Um, and so we'll be taking it in chunks We'll also be bouncing around a little bit throughout, so not everybody has to turn to John 15, but uh, for the de mo majority of this uh, session, we will be. All right, so let's dive right into it. <clears throat> so what does abide mean? Uh, it primarily means to remain in, right? To abide in this room is to stay here. It's kind of like a different version of loitering, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but you're, you're loitering in in your thoughts, in your heart, right? And so imagine just a bunch of people in the parking lot, you know, that's what they're doing. They're abiding in the parking lot in a way, sort of. But the way that, uh, that Jesus talks about it is a little different. So if somebody can read for me John 15, 1 through 4, that would be great. I am the true vine, and my father the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, and it may be that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word uh, because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Yeah. So I, a while back, did a deep study of John by myself uh, because I felt convicted to do so, and this was the hardest-hitting chapter in the entire book for me, okay? That's probably why whenever I sat down with the teaching team, they were like, you should probably pick the topic that you don't really want to do. I was like, that one. <laughs> so <clears throat> even though I did a lot of studying about it, it does hit me hard. So what does that mean? Like, Wow, uh, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit, right? Unless it abides in the vine. And now, remain in, what does that imply? That, re that implies that salvation has already taken place, right? That you're already there. You can't remain in the parking lot if you didn't get there in the first place, okay? So this is kind of primarily talking to people who have been saved, all right? And also, like, you can't abide in the vine if you never were a part of it in the first place either, right? And so it talks about, like, not bearing fruit. You're chopped off, right? And so moving on from that, God must abide in you for you to abide in him, 
right? That, that's a really important point because in a way, he kind of chooses you, right? And for us to abide in him is primarily, it's kind of a two-way street, okay? And so there's going to be, like I said late, earlier, there's kind of two sides to this coin. And a being, uh, having God abide in you and you abide in him is essentially equal to the relationship that we have with Christ, the salvation, Right? Being saved is having him abide in you and you abide in him. If he doesn't really abide in you, can you be saved? And can you abide in him if he doesn't abide in you? See, now it's like, now it's a puzzle, right? So that's kind of like what it means, okay? We're remaining in, but what does that look like? Well, to get to what it looks like, we need to understand why. So why should we abide? Can somebody read verses 5 through 8? I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him. Um, Can you speak up just a little bit? <laughs> whoever Thanks. abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does um, if anyone does not abide in me, he will be thrown away like a branch that withers, and the branches are gathered if you throw in, um, thrown in, into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Hey, one more. <laughs> yeah. Um, by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Thank you so much. All right. So this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Right? Just a di slightly different translation. And... To bear much fruit, that should be our primary motivation, right? We are already saved. It talks about chopping off branches and chucking them into the fire. That's really harsh imagery, but you got to think about the people he was talking to at the time, right? He was talking to Pharisees. He was talking to people who thought they were the most religious, most righteous people, right? And he's telling them, look, you can say all this stuff, but if you're not bearing fruit, you're going into the fire right? But to us, to those who, who have Christ in our hearts, right, this is the purpose, to glorify him, the Father, through what we do. But how can we do that in what we do if we're not doing the things that he's called us to do, right? And that's what abiding is about, right? It's about bearing fruit, knowing how to do that and when to do that, Right? So um, if somebody can pull up John 8, 31 through 32, this just kind of goes into what we're talking about a little bit. Thank you so much. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Great. So he's essentially saying that if you bear fruit, this is proof, right? You are showing that you are abiding, right? This is evidence of your salvation, it's the fruit. If we're not bearing fruit, where is the evidence? That's important to recognize for our own lives as well as it is for other people who we're trying to reach, right? So it's, it's proof, it's evidence. On top of that, it's glorifying to God and that should be something that, that we want to focus on. Also, one thing I want to mention on that verse, and also in this translation of, of this verse up here, is the disciples part. Uh, what does being a disciple mean? Well, that's emulating. It's following. It's trying to copy the actions and words and thoughts of whoever you're a disciple of, right? So if you're a disciple of Jesus, that's what you need to be trying to do. You need to try to copy and emulate and learn as much as you can about him so that you can be like him. That's all, the whole point of being a disciple. And so abiding is a huge crucial part of being a disciple. He literally says, if you're abiding in me, this is proof of your discipleship, right? So 
that's great. Yeah, good job. Adam, you've really described why we should do it and what it is, but like, how do we do that? Okay, glad you asked. Um, so, like I said earlier, there's two sides of this coin, abiding in Christ and abiding in God's love. How is that different? Well, it's not. It's the same thing, but like I said, it's two sides, looking at it from two separate angles. So, lots of verses. I told you we'd have a lot. I'm not going to make us read all of these, okay? But there is one that I would like, that I wanted to add, that I would like somebody to pull up, and that's 1 John 2.6. Somebody can please pull that up. Kind of sums up what we're talking about here. First uh, John two six. First John two six. Uh, whoever claims to live in Him must live as Jesus did. Yeah, that sums up pretty much all of this. These are examples of when Jesus went off into the wilderness or tried to be alone or just simply prayed when things were hard, okay? When things got tough for Jesus, what do you think he did? He didn't stress, he, he didn't watch Netflix, he didn't play video games, he sat and he prayed alone, right? He tried to remove himself from stressful situations to go be at peace with God. That is an example that I believe we should try to follow. He consistently pray, prayed, he remained in the Father's peace, and that goes back to my question earlier. What do you do when things get difficult? Do you follow Jesus' example? Do you try to remove yourself from other people and try to sit and pray about it? Do you try to read the word? Do you try to correlate with what it says with what's going on in your life? <laughs> no, probably not. Not a lot of the time, not for a lot of us. And that's one of the things that I kind of want to get across today is that this is super common in my own life and a lot of people that I see, their lives, when things get tough, they try to resort to a lot of different things. You know, they can resort to talking to their friends, and that's great, that's fellowship, right? But, you know, sometimes you need to be alone with God. And this is Je the examples of Jesus abiding in the Father. He gave us an example to follow. And it can be really easy to say, look, I know what Jesus did. I know what I should do. This is hard. It is hard. It is hard to set aside the common sense of your life and try to chase comfort and then try to pray. And sometimes it can feel like you're just talking to a wall. I talked to a, a friend of mine recently who said those exact words. He's like, sometimes when I try to pray, or pretty much all the time when he tries to pray, he says it's like talking to a wall. And I understood what he meant. I did. But that's not, Jesus doesn't call us to pray when, only when we feel like we're getting some out of it. You know, he doesn't say when God tells you, when you feel that feeling in your heart, oh, it's time to pray, that's when you should pray. No, he, he goes off and prays when times are difficult, when times are good, when he's tired, when he just needs to get away. And sometimes when it's just been too long and he hasn't prayed, he's like, man, I, I, he went off and he prayed. He went off to the top of mountains. He was alone. This is a good example of what abiding looks like as an example through Christ. So if you have any questions about, man, how do I sit down and I abide? Well, you can literally just read the Gospels and look at what Jesus did. Because he's the example of what we should be doing. This kind of leads into what I call the summer camp syndrome. And I talked to Pastor Nick about it uh, last week. Um, it's kind of an interesting story. You know, I was kind of opening up to him about some stuff. And uh, just kind of explained some stuff that's happened in the past couple of years. And he was like, wow, you could literally just take the last 15 minutes and that could be your sermon. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's crazy. And it was interesting to see how things in the past week, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but Interesting to see how things in the past week just leading up to preparing for a sermon can really just attack you. And the, exa the exact solution is exactly what <laughs> I was preparing for, which is just crazy to think about to me and just even more further evidence of God's work in my life. But the summer camp syndrome, if somebody can read Exodus 32.1, it's a little bit of a long one, but 
I really, I just want to, does anybody have this? You got it? Okay. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. <laughs> wow, stupid Israelites. <laughs> How dumb can you be? They literally saw the Red Sea part, right? You know, they got sent out of slavery. They've been provided manna for food, all this other stuff. Miracle after miracle. They literally, every day, they watch a giant tornado of fire lead them through the day. That is insane to think about that, oh, Moses was gone for like a month, and they're like, we need gods. God has abandoned us, and we need to make our own, and they're going to protect us, right? Stupid, stupid Israel. Well, I got news. <laughs> I got bad news for everyone in this room <laughs> because this is an example of what we do in our daily lives. It doesn't matter how much of a godly person you are, this is going to happen in your life. You're going to have moments where you don't rely on God for things because we're perfect beings, right? But for a lot of us, it happens more often than most, especially for me. I, I feel like this, I relate to this verse. And when I first read it years ago, when I tried to go through the Old Testament, I was like, wow, they are so dumb. They are so dumb. But I call this the summer camp syndrome because has anybody ever been to a, like a retreat, a weekend retreat, or like a summer camp? Yeah, everybody's on their head. That's great because it's so relatable, right? You know, you go, you get fired up. And you're like, yes, God, I'm going to go adopt a child. And I'm going to... I'm going to move to Africa, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to sell everything in my house, in my entire house, right? And then after you get home, you're like, well, you know, I kind of like my house, and uh, I already have two kids, and, you know, I, I, you know, I don't need to sell everything. I can, I can serve God where I'm at, right? That's what they always say, serve God where you're at. And then it just kind of slips into that. You're back into the normal routine, right? That's the summer camp syndrome, and I have been fighting this my entire life. I see it coming, too. When I go on retreat and I'm like, I feel like I'm really a, a lot closer to God when in reality, if God is abiding in you, you can't really get away from him. Nonetheless, <laughs> uh, I feel closer to God. And so I'll be like, I know what's coming in about a week. I will not feel this way and I will not be doing what I'm doing today. I can, I feel it. I know it because I've done it so many times. So yeah, stupid, stupid exit, stupid, stupid Israel, stupid, stupid me, right? So how do you keep from being like a Sunday Christian? You know, someone who goes just on Sundays and is like, I love Jesus. And then you go home and you're like, bills, you know, and just <laughs> life sucks, you know. And, you're just, and then Sunday comes and you're like, I can forget about all that. And it's Jesus, right? But no, it's an everyday thing. Or at least it should be. That's what Jesus says. Can somebody uh, read verse 3 again? And then if someone else can pull up Second Peter, um, that should be First Peter 1.3. Oh, I guess it must be second. Yeah, Second Peter 1.3. Okay. You got the next one. Uh, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Okay. So that's Second Peter. And then 15.3. I mean, we did already read it. I, I can read it. I don't think I need the mic, but that's, that's cool. <laughs> Thank you. You got it? Of course he does. Verse 3, chapter 15. Okay. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. That's it. Yep. I want to nail that point home. You are already clean. Do we have the tools that we need to be able to abide in Christ, to live a godly life? Yes, you absolutely do. There is no trying. I need to be closer to God before I can start doing X or doing Y, before I can start teaching on Sundays. No, you have the tools. You have them. God has given them to you through the Holy Spirit 
the day you were saved. Okay? You have all the tools you need. And he, when he says that you're already clean, you know, he's, he's driving a point home of you're already here. Stay here. Right? Abide here in me and I in you. And so one thing I kind of want to just throw in there that's a really cool, helpful tip is the three-legged stool, if anybody's heard about it. That is pray, fellowship, and quiet time. Quiet time being in the word, specifically. So pray constantly, consistently. Have fellowship. Talk to people who are in your church, who are Christians about your problems, and get godly counsel. And then quiet time, sit down, no distractions, alone. Read his word, and you know it all kind of works together. Pray right? Should be all together. Um, a th- two-legged stool doesn't typically stand. Typically. I like physics, so I'm not going to say never. <laughs> all right. So this is the, uh, the other side of the coin, right? And this is, this is where things get really practical, right? So we said, we looked at Jesus's life we saw some practical things that he does and a good example of what he does on a day-to-day basis as far as abiding in the Father, right? Being alone, solitude, prayer, quiet-minded, focused on God. But there's another side to it that isn't so private, right? So can somebody read verses 9 through 11? Anybody in it? Anybody. I told you we were going to do a lot of reading today. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you all this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Wow. That's great. You know, there's there's really two important ways to look at abiding in God's love. One, as a commandment. Right? I mean, he says, just as I have kept my father's commandments and I abide in his love. Right? He's saying, these things I have spoken to you. Do these things also. Right? Keep the commandments. It's also something that brings purpose and joy. Right? Purpose in the sense of, like I said earlier, and how it mentioned earlier, that it is glorifying to God to bear fruit. Now, and just like in the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, where he talks about, you know, bearing fruit, some people will bear 10 times, 20 times, 30 times. Some people bear more fruit visibly than others, and that's okay. But at least they're bearing fruit, right? They need to have some evidence in their life that they have been changed through Christ, right? There needs to be evidence there. Because if there is no evidence of this fruit, if there is no fruit, you have, you actually have quite the opposite. The fruit is the evidence that you're abiding. The lack thereof is evidence of the contrary. Okay? So you need to examine your own lives. Try to look at, you know, where is my fruit? What fruit am I bearing? When I did that, I got really scared. Because I was like, wow, God, what are you doing through my life? Sometimes you can't see it. And that's okay. You know, that's what the whole fellowship thing was about, the three-legged stool, right? You can't just all be wrapped up in your own mind. And so this part is talking about an outward expression, loving others as you love yourself, right? So <clears throat> this is the longest verse <laughs> or verse section in today's s- sermon. Um, so if somebody can please bring up verses 12 through 16 who doesn't mind talking for a little bit. (laughs) You want to go for it? Go for it. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command you, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all that I have heard from 
my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, so, I mean, one of those parts in that verse was like, you know, he'll give you whatever you ask, right? It's like, can I have a Corvette? But no, that's not really what it's talking about. Um, there's a whole other sermon on the fear of the Lord and supplicating your will for his, right? There's a whole other sermon on that. But uh, for today, we're mainly just talking about, you know, abiding in Christ or abiding in God, loving one another and following his commands, right? What greater love is there than a man willing to lay down his life for his friends, right? And that's exactly what Jesus did. He said, I call you my friends. He's foreshadowing here, right? And the, the whole part where he's like, you did not choose me, but I chose you, that's also a whole other sermon. <laughs> but this, it was this chapter that really grabbed me a couple years ago when I went through uh, a little bit of a conviction. I questioned my salvation. And I was looking at these verses. And if you can imagine, if you're questioning your, questioning your salvation here today, maybe you're not, maybe you are, but maybe you can imagine looking at these verses, looking at the, the dead branches and being like, am I a dead branch? Is he going to cut me off and throw me away? Even though I want to abide, is he just going to throw me away? Do I have a choice in the matter? It says he chooses me, right? Do I, have, do I even have a choice? And this was a three-week-long battle inside of my heart um, where every time I prayed, you know, I would go to work, I would do things, get my mind off things, but every time I thought about God, I felt like a sharp pain. And it was intense. And I know that it was a feeling, and sometimes feelings can be misleading, but this was, this was more so. This was a intense conviction. It was something that I knew that I wasn't doing. And I feel like it was abiding. Abiding in God. Abiding in Christ. I, I love other people a lot. But he's saying to be willing to lay down my life. And it's not just dying. It's living. Just like Romans 12.1, right? We're supposed to present our lives as a living sacrifice. And if you're presenting your life as a living sacrifice to God, you're following his commandments. His second greatest commandment is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's after loving him, right? So, to abide is to obey, right? Jesus commanded us to abide. He's commanding us to obey God. Obey the Father. Be a humble friend. Right? So, some personal struggles, you know, that I went through just this week were listed on the screen. Unworthiness. You know, <laughs> I gave... I, like I said earlier, I gave my sermon to Nick, <laughs> and I was just like, I didn't even know it. You know, I hadn't, I literally told him, I was like, I haven't prepared at all. I feel terrible. And he was like, uh, you kind of, you kind of have. <laughs> or at least God has prepared it for you, right? God has prepared you, at the very least, which blew my mind. <laughs> um, it really did. Distractions. I've had, just this week alone, I've had, you know, I've had to wake up at 4.30 in the morning every day starting this past two weeks. You know, I've had friends call me out of the blue being like, hey, can we talk? During the time periods where I would set aside time, right? I literally, I was feeling kind of, I was feeling down, right? I was like, you know, I'm going to go get some Chick-fil-A. This is God's chicken, right? It's close enough. <laughs> close enough to abiding. No. But I should have set aside time in that moment where I was feeling down to abide, to pray. Because that's the whole topic that I was going to be teaching on, right? 
But instead, I turned to something that I normally do, which is food. It's a worldly thing. And when I got there, I had a, a good friend of mine sit down. He was like, I can tell you're going through something. And it was really sweet. I feel like he was sent, you know, by God. He's not a Christian. He's not. But I feel like he was kind of sent a little bit to kind of just pull me out of that. But the reality is we talked for two hours. And I had to wake up at 4.30 in the morning. It was like 11 by the time I got back. So sleep deprivation was a major issue. And it was because I wasn't, I was choosing to do other things. And so these things were, you know, I had problems at home pop up just this week. And, of course, the exhaustion from waking up. So all of this to say is that I feel like if there was nothing important for me to say today, this stuff wouldn't have happened. Right? And I really want you all to, to take home this. I don't want to make your lives miserable. Okay? But there is a sense of, of pain when you are convicted of something that you're just not doing. And as much as I don't want you guys to, to go through the pain, I want you guys to go through that development. The development that God can, can perform in your life through that. You know, I saw a video the other day of Morgan Freeman being God, right? In, in a movie, of course, not actually. But he was in a movie, and he was like, you know, talking to this girl, and I've seen the movie before, but... He was like, you know, do you think when, when people pray for patience, God just flips a switch, gives them patience? Or does he give them opportunities to be patient? Or do you think if a family, if someone prays to have a better relationship with their family, or their family's falling apart, and they pray, can we just love each other more? Do you think he just makes them magically love each other, or does he give them opportunities to love each other? You know, situations to love each other through. And as much as, like, I don't want to rely on Hollywood for my theological thought processes, uh, I, think, I think that was pretty well stated. I think, I think somebody put some effort into writing that script. So, today, I have a challenge for you all. What is one thing that you can be intentional about this week? You know, if, if you're struggling with putting aside time every day. Some people aren't. Because, like, Nick told me the other day that there was, like, this pastor at that conference over the winter break. What was it called? It was uh, Faith Walkers. I wanted to go to that. But there was this conference, and, like, th these guys, they were like, who's been reading the Bible for the, every day for the past year or two? And, like, tons of people stood up. That's awesome. That's great. You know, that's wonderful. But it's not just about that. Because the Pharisees did that too, right? They took pride in it. And this is, a, this is about humble obedience. This isn't about building yourselves up to be the super Christian. And it, it's also about keeping yourself from falling into that trap of being that Sunday Christian too. I used to always be really passionate about the Sunday Christian until I figured out that I was one. Okay, so what is one thing that you can be intentional this week in doing? You don't need to be Superman and read the Bible 40 hours a week, but you can start somewhere. What is one thing you can be intentional, and what is one thing you can do to abide in your daily life? You have all the examples you need. You have all the tools you need. You have everything you could possibly want in order to get this done. God doesn't want to see you not succeed in this area. He abides in you, and he expects you to abide in him back. So let's do that going forward. Let's pray.